Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Developing the Leader Within Podcast. I'm your host, Enrique Acosta Gonzalez. And today I have a special guest with me. Uh, not only had, did he serve as Mick Pond in the United States Navy, uh, but he is a true leader, one that I've known for quite a while. Uh, he's also the CEO and CFO of Her Consulting Inc. Uh, Mick Pond, her, thank you so much for being with us. Well, it's an honor to be back together with you. Uh, you know, uh, the first time we met was way over in Hawaii a number of years ago. And uh, while I was still in uniform and golly, all these years later, we're still talking with each other. That's a, that's a, a gift uh, that just keeps on giving. I agree. Uh, uh, you know, if anybody has, uh, has benefited from this, uh, this relationship, it has been me. Uh, I've seen you, uh, you know, in action in the Navy as one, as one of our make ponds. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you, you all, 15 of you have been a treasure to us. Uh, and I'm fortunate to be speaking with you uh, today. So, uh, folks, we're going to be talking about leadership and service. Uh, and, and I'm so happy to dive into this because, uh, you know, when you get to the top of the Navy, you, you, you're a leader, right? So, uh, either, I that or very, take... either that or very lucky, uh, which I think I was in part. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I observed you, so you were good. You were good. So, uh, today, as we talk about leadership and service, um, I want to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my story begins, of course, with my parents. I grew up out in uh, southwestern Kansas for a few years of the early part of my life, and then um, up in uh, I call Wyoming is really where my, I I did most of my development, Casper, Wyoming. Joined the Navy in 1967, uh, and as luck would have it, uh, just a, a week or two, went to boot camp just a week or two after uh, Delbert Black became the first Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy. And uh, uh, was in the nuclear power program, uh, so my job was uh, to, uh, to operate and supervise the operation and repair of nuclear propulsion plants. I did uh, tours in uh, three submarines, I uh, was chief of the boat on one of those. And uh, then I also served on a nuclear guided missile cruiser. Uh, served on one conventional aircraft carrier. Uh, my final sea tour was as Command Master Chief of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, the aircraft carrier. And from there, uh, just ended up uh, going from pretty much from one Command Master Chief job to the next. Uh, tried to retire a few times. Um, each time I got close to retirement, I got talked out of it by uh, uh, mentors. Uh, I was the command, I, after leaving Theodore Roosevelt, I was command master chief of nuclear field day school, got my MBA while I was there and uh, was going to retire when uh, Dwayne Bushy uh, convinced me to stay and take a job uh, to be the command master chief. Actually, let me back up a minute. I was coming off my chief of the boat tour on Skipjack, the submarine Skipjack and went to be the Command Master Chief of Nuclear Field Day School. Um, was gonna retire from there. Dwayne Bushy called me, Mick, he, he was Mick Pond number seven. Uh, called me and uh, convinced me to uh, consider the job as being Command Master Chief on Theodore Roosevelt. So I did that, I was gonna retire from there. Uh, Mick Pond number eight, Dwayne, or, uh, uh, John Hagen called me and said, uh, would you consider going on being Command Master Chief of Naval Training Center Great Lakes? Uh, so I did that. I was going to retire from there. And uh, um, uh, again, Mick Von Hagen asked me uh, to consider competing for the job of uh, Force Master Chief for Naval Education and Training Command down in Pensacola. I was lucky enough to be selected and uh, was going to retire from there. And my boss, uh, Vice Admiral Tracy, uh, and I were talking one day and she thought uh, I should put a package into uh, for Mick Pond, which I did. And I was uh, very select, uh, very lucky to be selected. So that's a little bit about me. I retired in 2002. I was Mick Pond, uh, Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy from 98 to 02. And um, upon retiring from there, um, uh, we just decided we were going to move back down to Pensacola. I didn't have a job. All the job offers were in the DC area and we knew we didn't want to stay there. So uh, 
I got together with a retired flag officer friend and uh, said, how do you spell consulting? He told me how to spell it. Uh, I did exactly what he said to do. Uh, came down to Pensacola, set up a one-man uh, consulting business. And uh, that one-man consulting business now uh, has turned into a, approximately 200 employees. We've been going at it since uh, 2002 and uh, doing very well. So I now live a little south uh, east of uh, Birmingham, Alabama, and um, uh, just enjoying life. I love it. You know, I heard that story before as we talked and shared uh, lunch or breakfast or whatever it was at the time. Um, and it always, you know, it always surprises me, uh, you know, how much opportunity is out there post, you know, service. And uh, I'm so glad you did start that uh, consulting firm uh, because you've done very well. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Now for, for the folks listening, right, for the next five weeks, you're going to see some special folks. And, and Mick Pond uh, Hurt is the, is the first of five of, uh, of what I would uh, tell you that are, are my advisors. Uh, they, they are gentlemen that have uh, proven, you know, leadership and, and that I highly regard. So uh, Mick Pond, as we, are, as we dive into this leadership and service, uh, you know, theme or subject, um, what does service mean to you and, and how did that mold you in, in your career? Well, I think the idea of service um, probably started with my dad. Uh, my dad was a battleship sailor during World War II, uh, saw battle in the South Pacific and the like. Uh, he, and, and I say, I think it came to me from him because I don't ever remember sitting down and specifically uh, talking to him about service or uh, he didn't talk much about his service in the Navy, but um, Back here on the wall, uh, you can see a picture hanging there, a partial picture. It's a picture of his battleship. Uh, and at the bottom of the battleship uh, picture uh, is the battle stars that uh, the USS Mississippi uh, uh, won uh, during World War II. And um, originally that picture, uh, it's just a lithograph, uh, printed basically on newspaper print. Uh, but they, at the end of the war, each, they gave each crew member a serving platter with that uh, underneath the glass. And uh, it always hung in, in our house. And uh, again, my dad didn't talk much about it, but I, I remember looking at that picture and I had his cruise book. And so I think from an early age, I just always knew I was gonna go in the Navy. Um, and I think growing up in the Navy, I don't think I necessarily overtly thought about service, but it, it just became something particularly from that World War II generation that you did. Um, this idea of, of serving your country in some capacity was strong within that, that generation. And I think more by osmosis than anything else, um, it, it's been passed on to those of us that were lucky enough to have parents like that. But I will also tell you, uh, my generation, uh, I, I graduated high school in, in the mid 60s that was a tough generation. Uh, there was a whole lot of people that were very confused about life uh, at that period of time. Um, and uh, so there, there were really two groups. There were those that really understood and were carrying on the tradition of their, their parents. And the other one were, was a group of folks that seemed to be breaking away uh, and uh, thinking differently. So uh, I'm honored to say that I, I, I I think I think more like my parents than the other group. Yeah, that's a, it's amazing to have uh, parents that, you know, emulate these attributes like service uh, so that we, the children and the, you know, and the children's children can see that habit of putting something greater before yourself and allowing yourself to, to, to do that uh, in life. Uh, well, you know, I, it's really interesting you say that because, um, you know, my dad joined the Navy at, he was only 16 years old at the time, uh, lied about his age to get in, believe it or not. But the drive to go off and do something, um, you, you know, for your, for somebody other than yourself, I think, uh, was, 
uh, it lived large within that generation that, uh, you know, when your country was threatened as ours was in World War II, you just picked up, uh, dropped what you were doing, picked up and went and served to the point of lying about your age and, and doing anything you could to become part of the group that was going to go off and defend this country. Yeah, that's beautiful. Now, in, in leadership, one of the one of the challenges <laughs> there is, uh, is the service. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a big misconception uh, among leadership. Uh, who is to serve who, <laughs> right? And, uh, and we know that some of the attributes that make a great leader is the fact that they serve someone else other than themselves. And emphatically, the, the one attribute that makes a, a, a leader not so good is the one that's always seeking service coming their way, right? And so it's a big, it's a big determining factor there between a, a positive leader, a negative leader, a good and a bad leader. Um, how does, how do you see service being uh, a part of leadership uh, on the positive side? Well, certainly, um, service is, as, as you said, it, by definition, is providing something uh, of value to another person, uh, doing something for someone other than yourself. And uh, so it requires uh, first of all, you've got to kind of get out of this mindset of um, uh, everyone's there to serve you. And, and I think back in my first years of the Navy uh, that <clears throat> I think I was more quick to recognize those that didn't do, you know, weren't serving others. Uh, it's a lot easier to spot those folks than um, many times than it is the, fo the, the people that are being selfless and providing uh, services uh, to others. By, by definition, you have to subjugate yourself to a certain degree that uh, it's not about you. It's about doing for others. And I, I don't think, uh, again, I, I wish I could say that I was so bright and I was so worldly uh, that I, I thought about service. I don't think I did uh, until I got into the upper reaches of leadership at the Department of the Navy or, you know, at the, uh, you know, the echelon two and three level uh, before you start understanding what service is all about. Up until that point, you're just doing uh, what you're obligated to do, uh, what, you know, what your body is telling you to do, what your mind is telling you to do. Now, if in fact you have been raised in a, in a way to believe that um, the best thing for, to, you know, you really want to help other people around you and, you and it becomes a part of who you are, then uh, services come sort of natural. Uh, if you have been raised to be very selfish, and ego, egotistical, then uh, you're going to have to work at service. But when you get into the upper level of leadership and you start understanding, you start actively looking and seeking out uh, opportunities to serve. Uh, I, I think that, that it becomes a little more than just um, uh, autonomic reaction. It becomes something that you actually look to do. And um, so, <clears throat> uh, but, but, Poor leaders uh, invariably, invariably, uh, one of their outstanding attributes of a poor leader is somebody that's using everybody else to make themselves uh, look better or finding ways to make everybody's light shine a little dimmer so yours shines a little brighter. Uh, and we've all seen that, those folks. Funny because most of the challenges come from the difference between the person serving or being served. And so when you talk about, you know, daily routine, um, and I, I'm one that will tell folks immediately, right? Leadership begins when you open your eyes. Uh, leadership is a life. It's life. That's what you live. You live a life of leadership. And so if you're the type of person that only dons on the robe of leadership when you're going through your company doors, it's not going to work. Uh, it may work for a little while, but it's not going to work in the long run. 
And so when you have service at the forefront of a leader, it, it's a, a discriminating factor I mean, or determining factor of how far in leadership they are gonna go. Um, so if, if, if you have leaders, you know, for the leaders that are, let's say maybe they weren't brought up with service in their home, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they now they're faced with leadership um, and in that position, how would you or what would you tell them uh, ways of they, that they can incorporate uh, service into their day to day? Well, you know, it's that's that's a really interesting question, because I'll tell you, um, if you're not predisposed by some way. In other words, you, you the, this idea of service hasn't been demonstrated to you in such a way that it has become part of you. Uh, then you do have to take some overt action to kind of understand what it's about and get on with it. Uh, one of the, uh, and, and I'm really surprised that it took as long as it did, but one of the things that came out of the 90s, mid, uh, early to mid 90s, was this idea of servant leadership. Uh, and what servant leadership to me is all about is it really codifies, it really um, uh, delineates and lays out this idea of supporting everybody around you such that um, as a team or as um, a, a, a group, you're, you're able to accomplish and everybody uh, prospers. Uh, that's what service is really about, is helping others so that they can prosper. Um, maybe just survive uh, in many cases, but what you, the ultimate goal is that people uh, develop this uh, ability to prosper and grow uh, into um, something better than they would have been had you not been there. So uh, I think if, so, if I ran into somebody that uh, just was not getting it, uh, the first thing I'd tell them and have them do is uh, study up on the idea of, uh, uh, it's, it's a whole field of study now, uh, this idea of servant leadership. And typically what it is, a lot of people think of organizations, and when I say organizations, that could be family. Uh, you know, a family is an organization, a community, whatever. When I think of them, many people think of the leader sitting on top of a pyramid. And it's everybody's job below that pyramid to support them so that they can sit on top of the pyramid. Um, servant leadership turns that pyramid upside down. It puts the leader at the bottom of the pyramid supporting everybody on top uh, to produce the, the, the desired outcomes. And uh, I mean, if you're of the mindset that you set at the top of a pyramid, it, it's a radical mind shift to get into the idea of, hey, bud, you're not, you're not the reason we're here. We're the reason you're here. Uh, and that's in, in terms of my company, um, I just brought into this company what you and I learned uh, years and years ago about if you take care of people, they end up taking care of you. Um, and I've told uh, numerous CPO messes, chief petty officer messes, uh, that very story. I, it, it sounds like it's a little play on words, but when you make it all about somebody else, they'll make it all about you. You don't have to go run around telling everybody how important you are uh, because you, they're going to tell everybody how important you are to them. Uh, so. that, yeah, that, that's, a, that's for sure. Uh, as you was talking, you know, my, my mind started going, I'm, taking, I'm having pictures in my head <laughs> of, of, you know, of this row team, right? And this row team and this leader, you know, at the helm, and he's he's saying, you know, go go this yeah, way, go yeah. this way. That's, good. That's uh, a good analogy. You know, but but the but what makes him a great leader is that he can look back to each individual member and address their individual needs to help them row, you know, consistently and and effortlessly, and you know, that's that's what the leader does. More importantly, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking, what, what's a better picture of than a guy sitting uh, or gal sitting in the, 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 uh, on the bow of a boat with the megaphone yelling, row, 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 or stroke, I guess they call it, <laughs> and looking out there and there's nobody sitting out in front of them. 
you know, <laughs> that's many leaders get that way. They, they're out there yelling uh, all about themselves and pretty soon they find out there's nobody that they're talking to. So yeah, that's a, that's a great analogy. I like that. Yeah. That's, that's when you get the, um, the comment of it's lonely at the top. <laughs> well, it's lonely at the it's top. Lonely at the top. That, that is not a, uh, that's not a fallacy. You know, what makes it lonely at the top, frankly, I, I thought a lot about that. Uh, and, and it happened to me, I, I, I would tell you. And that is when you get into a position where you have the ability to affect other people, uh, like much as a captain on a ship, uh, you know, where everybody's life is in your hands, uh, so to speak, as a captain, um, you know, those people that that you used to have a relationship, it changes the dynamics of the relationship so much. And, and what, it, what they really mean is you don't have anybody to really communicate with. You're no longer a, a peer member. Right. And, uh, and I experienced some of that as Mass Chief of the Navy. I have tons and tons of friends, great friends such as yourself. And, and most of them uh, would never hesitate to tell me what they thought about what I was doing. Um, you know, it, it, that's sort of a trait of a chief petty officer to start with. Right, right. So I was blessed that way, but there were, there were some, and, uh, it did change the dynamic. some. well, uh, folks, those that are listening leaders that are struggling with, uh, incorporating service. I hope that you, uh, were able to take some of that information shared by Mick Parnhurst, her, uh, be able to incorporate that into your daily life because your people will love you for it. Uh, and, and we're not talking about the type of service that now you're, 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 you're not leading, right? So you have to lead. But the type of leadership service that can lead and support their team simultaneously. And there's a way to do that. Uh, there's a way to do that and still be uh, sound about all your judgments and all the decisions that you have to make. Uh, and so I hope that some of these comments that we've been making have helped you in some way, shape, or form. Uh, Mick Pond, if, if someone wanted to uh, contact you or, or get a hold of you of some, some sort, um, how would they do that? Well, there's a couple of ways. Uh, certainly, uh, you can get a hold of me uh, through her consulting if all else fails. But uh, my, uh, uh, my email address uh, is just jim.hurt, H-E-R-D-T, uh, -E the D is silent at um, uh, hurtconsulting, one word, dot com. But there's also something else. Uh, I have a book here. Um, this is a book. I've got it. Yeah, I've got it right. Um, <clears throat> this is a book that um, my commanding officer, uh, when I was command mass chief on, on the aircraft carrier Theodore Roosevelt, and I just finished uh, a little uh, less than a year ago. And um, uh, uh, then Captain Stan Bryant, now retired Rear Admiral Stan Bryant, he and I were just an incredible team uh, on that ship. That ship was, I have to say, the best afloat command I, I ever served on. Uh, and it was because we had really cracked the nut on how to communicate in an effective way to make everybody part of the team. And uh, so it's not a very thick book. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Uh, this is not a plug to get you to buy the book, believe me. This is a book that I believe would really help you. It is just, abs it, it is not full of theory. It's all about pragmatic approaches and how to handle things as a leader. And uh, most of the, the, the comments that I get back on it after people have read it and said, this is a book you really need to have in your top desk drawer as a leader uh, so that you, uh, you know, when you run into those situations where you, you know, you either recognize it as a leadership opportunity or it's a conundrum that you can't quite figure out, you, you can pull it out. And uh, one of my old bosses, uh, one of my other previous uh, commanding officers said, uh, I'm keeping it in my top uh, desk drawer. That way, when I run into one of those problems, I can pull it out and say, what would Stan and Jim do? And that's what this is all about. Uh, if, if you, you really want a really easy, uh, and like I say, very pragmatic, not, a, not wrapped up in a whole bunch of theory. Uh, this is, this is what might be the book for you. It's on Amazon. 
Outstanding. No, it, what you don't know is that uh, a lot of times I throw these books out there for people to uh, go entertain. I'm definitely going to get a copy. Uh, and, well, you're and, not going to have to because I'm going to send you one. So everybody <laughs> else might have to. Be <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, but folks, you know, uh, there there are a lot of resources out there, that book being one. Uh, Mick Pond, thank you so much for sharing uh, this leadership and service topic with me. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing your afternoon with me. Uh, and, uh, you know, for everybody out there, you know how we end up our podcast. Success to you.